Ralph Jacobson's interest in photovoltaics developed during his time as a material science student in CMS. He is the founder and CEO of IPS Solar, a leading Minnesota developer of solar power systems. Beginning with small off-grid installations, his company now builds megawatt-scale community solar gardens. He served as the founding board chair of the Minnesota Solar Industries Solar Energy Industries Association and currently serves on several boards. His interests now include pioneering energy storage in the Midwest solar market and encouraging diversity in his industry. Thank you. Oops, I think I just took it off. How are we doing? Can you hear me? Okay, good. Do I have to negotiate for time? I realize I'm the one batting clean up here, and uh, I'm the only one standing between you and lunch. So, uh, oh, uh, what do we have to work with? Say 12.05. 12.05. Oh, you're going to give me the 12.02. 12.02. Okay. <laughs> See what I can do. Okay, so uh, I guess we're going to go from the macro to the micro here. Um, my my uh, presentation is more a personal uh, journey. Um, because really, I, I just won, well, it, okay, at the end of 2017, I won the award from Inc. Magazine, the uh, award for having the fastest growing business in the Twin Cities. And, you know, I was sitting in the back of the room. <laughs> my, my salesman said, well, why don't you go to this? You know, it's because, you know, we'd had a photo shoot on a roof and um, said, why don't you go to this and just kind of see what happens? And they didn't clue me in. And so as I watched the award number five, for the 50th fastest in the 49th, we get down to number 10 and I think, well, I should probably go now. I mean, you know, I'm just going to be jealous. And, and so we get down to number one and everybody turns around and looks at me. I go, what? Um, but uh, because uh, I, the way I would say this is that my journey is about um, coming from a technical background and making an about face and deciding that I'm going to get out there in industry and, um, and it's all about the market. And so I have not had anybody to talk to about uh, density of states and you know, the kind of things that I you know, studied in um, material science. It's about um, how are we gonna get uh, the next buyer group to be interested. And that's a totally different conversation. It's about financeability. So um, I just wanna give you kind of a, a how did I get in, onto that uh, path and, and really move away from kind of the technical one. So I want to say that I was a, um, uh, my mother went to the university when I was a little kid finishing her degree and we went to the Bell Museum and places like that um, around the university campus and it was just so interesting. I really developed a bond with the university and I knew as a, a high school student that I was going to go to the University of Minnesota. I also should admit that uh, CEMS, C-E-M-S, uh, was my third try at the university. Um, my first two failed miserably because I was really interested in other things. And so, um, for instance, I was in, um, in, lived in Mexico and as a, a teenager. My parents decided to just get out of the U.S. in 1968. It was just too wild and crazy, so let's go <laughs> live in Mexico. So we sold the house, lived in Mexico. Later... When we came to, uh, when, when I was, had found myself to, uh, my way to uh, CEMS, I think 75% of the graduate students at that time were from Spanish-speaking countries. And I found that I had a rudimentary uh, ability to communicate in Spanish. And it, it was uh, really delightful. That was one aspect of uh, uh, CEMS that I really appreciated, was that there, it made that connection for me. Um, and as a matter of fact, we've, as we've talked before this, uh, I think maybe I should go reestablish some of those connections. Um, okay, so part of my uh, dilemma about you know, being, uh, uh, exploring a technical bent was that um, I grew up in the age of Love Canal and the Cuyahoga River uh, catching fire and a lot of environmental damage. And I really um, could not see myself being involved in most of the things that I felt were actually just, uh, I don't want to make a career contributing to that. And so uh, it, was, uh, it was really uh, difficult for me. 
I found that um, the things that I was interested in um, in my first couple of attempts at the, the university were um, like the 5,000 level classes, not the things you had to study in order to get to the 5,000 level class. <laughs> and so what I found since then, I'm sorry, this picture just really didn't, uh, unless it looks better from back there, um, is that there are many ways to get there and that um, I chose one that I eventually found my way to, but I could have found other ways. So, um, so I would say that uh, in the early 70s, what I was really more interested in was, again, this is about the market, was um, in helping to set up food cooperatives, uh, like the Mississippi market in St. Paul. and So um, rubbing elbows with a lot of people who were engaged in that, let's say, creating market where none existed for organic farming, for organic produce. I, my wife and I just got really excited about, we're going to be organic orchardists. And so she took some money that her grandfather um, had distributed to the grandkids and was, uh, you know, he thought we were going to learn how to play the stock market. Uh, we bought land. And in his view, we sort of sold the cow for three magic beans. So, um, but... <laughs> We planted an orchard, and in two years we watched it turn into a bunch, well, actually this, this picture doesn't really do it justice. Um, it, was, it was as if somebody, some prankster, had taken all our apple trees up and replaced them with baseball bats in nice orderly rows, because the gophers and the deer made short work of, of all those things. So when people ask me, how did you, on, on, how on earth did you, in, in a place in Minnesota where there was no market for photovoltaics, for solar, where there was actually a lot of bla bad blood because of the previous attempts to use solar energy that were, didn't work very well. Well, I'm not comparing it to, you know, having a job at 3M or something. I'm comparing it to planting an orchard in Wisconsin where you might as well be trying to start a steel mill or some <laughs> steel fabrication plant right out of, you know, college. So uh, that made um, starting a, a solar business look relatively easy. So I, I think that's... Uh, it's all what you compare to, right? The, uh, the thing about the... Uh, in the 1970s um, and forming food co-ops and all was that also there were the OPEC oil embargoes. And so there was a lot of effort. Uh, like I, I think every, uh, every farmer in Iowa at one point wanted to turn their, uh, their old barn into a, a, a windmill manufacturing plant. And so there was just this wave of uh, interest in, the first wave of interest in renewable energy. And I, um, I got into doing, uh, working as an energy auditor, and it seemed to me, like I, I don't know if any of you watched The Invisible Man, the one with Claude Rains from the 1930s, where he walks into the room and he starts taking his clothes off, and then he pulls the tape off, and he's doing a strip tease, but there's nothing there. But then he goes on in the movie, and he's like, as an invisible man, he's just doing all kinds of mischief and, and ransacking. And energy seemed like something that is invisible to most of us. And I wanted to understand um, electricity. I wanted to understand energy. And so as an energy auditor, I, I got to be um, pretty good at seeing you know, how heat escapes from uh, your house and, and so on and so forth. Um, so... That, that was sort of a background uh, as I was learning about electricity and energy. And I think that um, after that, I, during the Carter years, I really um, thought that, okay, solar energy, now this is what I'm going to make my career on. And, and I really formed a bond with solar energy because I thought, okay, we're going to do something practical with this. And I think that uh, it really has turned out that way, although not as I had thought. Um, when I was in... Uh, so I'm, I'm going to actually talk about how I think chemical engineering and Matt Sai um, prepared me to own a business, which are probably unexpected. Um, but I learned not to drink coffee because I, I remember sitting in the whole coffee house trying to do a physics problem where it would take at least two hours to even set it up, much less start to solve it. And I, I trying with coffee in my um, pulsing through my blood. That was a four-hour attempt to try to um, set it up and an eight-hour attempt to solve it uh, because it just, uh, my mind was not like able to focus. And, and so I don't drink coffee and I, um, instead, my brother-in-law, whom I, I hated, um, he told me one word when, um, early on in his and my sister's relationship, which was um, persistence because I told him I wanted to form a business. So... Um, 
That word has really been sort of the hallmark of my attempt to grow a business of uh, solar energy in Minnesota where no market existed. Um, I also want to say here that um, trying to take off the, uh, the techie hat where it, you know, it was very interesting learning about density of states and, and uh, um, you know, all the stuff that Stephanie was talking about. That, just, that was an amazing tour of uh, de force of uh, material science. Um, and by the way, my wife is a diabetes educator. She started out as an RN, and she now is a, uh, really what more you would call an IT person showing diabetics how to uh, operate the equipment. And, and by the way, they're not going to die in the next two years if they you know, pay attention. Um, so uh, many, many times I've been at wit's end wondering, okay, how am I going to you know, make payroll next Friday? How am I going to um, you know, solve you know, some problem that electronic that uh, I should have studied electrical engineering on that side? You know? um, so I, um, I would ask God for help. And my job, when I let go of that, that request, was to recognize the, um, the help when it came. And often it came in the form of an annoying person. <laughs> and that was really hard for me to recognize until I saw the pattern. <laughs> and it's still true. I mean, my, my, my exit strategy is two very ambitious young men who want to take over the business and want to really make me emeritus. And the, it annoys me because I'm not ready to leave, but you know, I find that they're better at doing the things that I hired them to do than I am. And so... Okay, so um, I, I worked at the Center for Interfacial Engineering and studied brittle materials. And I think that uh, photovoltaics, photovoltaic modules, are basically made of brittle materials, glass and silicon wafers, um, and then very tiny you know, wiring that uh, infuses the panel. And really understanding, nobody really wants to, under, to talk about, uh, le the, the, let's say, the useful life of... Um, something that you're going to put out in the weather and have it, um, you know, weather tornadoes, uh, hailstorms, um, and a lot of that uh, aging that happens in the sunlight. Um, and here we are trying to collect sunlight and, you know, create electricity out of it. Um, and, and so I find that material science really prepared me for thinking about, um, you know, uh, uh, materials testing, uh, life cycle, um, and I, I like being able to point these kinds of things out when we're talking about financeability, because you know, in financing, the the uh, the returns come over time, and if the materials are weathering more quickly than the returns are coming, you got a problem somewhere <laughs> out in like year fifteen or maybe year eight. Um, and so that just that awareness. I also would say that the 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 guy that I started the business with, um, Al Justiniano. Um, I met working in Chris McCosco's polymer lab. So I had a job as a student, and uh, Al did, and as we were, you know, going about doing our work, you know, we would start talking about, you know, what we were interested in, and, and uh, he was getting his MBA at the Carlson School while I was getting my degree, and we graduated at the same time, and so we decided to form um, the business Innovative Power Systems, which I, I realized that I didn't put that up anywhere. Um, but we formed that business, and I had him for a year. And talking about market, um, being uh, uh, he was Puerto Rican, he is Puerto Rican, uh, and he was putting grant proposals in uh, during that year for uh, theater that he wanted to have. And at about a year, the um, the arts world was recognizing that he was um, that the Latinos were were way underrepresented in in the arts world, and he got every grant, I think he got a dozen grants that he applied for. And so at, at about one year, he had showed me how persistence pays off when you're trying to develop a relationship-based sale, like the Science Museum of Minnesota was one of our early customers. Um, so he showed me how persistence works, but then at some point he said, okay, gotta go. Boy, was I jealous. I mean, here he had his market. Well, his, his market was the people that he was going to um, have invite in to see his shows, but he had the uh, financial backing suddenly. And so, um, really, I, I would have to say that I couldn't have grown the business and stayed in the game without my wife's support. Her job as a nurse was just the foundation for our, 
finances, and I, 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 whenever I talk about the business, I need to honor her for, uh, I, she's at work right now, otherwise she'd have to listen to me. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, okay, so I, um, one thing that, um, that occurred uh, in our rocky relationship around the business was that I, early on, in 1991, when I started the business, I decided I better um, define success for myself, otherwise... Um, I'm not going to know what it looks like. So um, when it when it comes, even if in the form of an annoying person. Right? Um, so as a, a local expert, I nobody else knew about photovoltaics. I'd spent so much time in the stacks at Walter Library, um, you know, reading articles that were poorly written and um, and then wondering what day it was when I came out. Um, but understanding photovoltaics, so I, I quickly became the local expert. So crossed that one off or check it, um, became a resource for the community. I also realized that um, wearing 27 hats, I was not going to be able to keep all of them um, you know, up on my head without falling on the ground. So I, I early on realized I needed to build a team. And for a while, it was two, you know, two or three guys in a pickup truck, and we did what we sold and, and kind of eked along. Um, but I'd say about... Um, Ten years after I had written that, and, and then it disappeared under a pile of papers, and I found it, and I showed it to my wife. And she read it, and she cried, because she said, you know, I've been making you wrong, because you, I thought you, it was about, okay, you're going to get a business going, and you're going to make money, and then I can uh, go back to part-time, and, and be an artist, and, and you can, um, you know, take over, and, and it hadn't worked out that way, but you define success in a way that, that was more realistic and, and all those things you've done, you know, after 10 years. Um, and so she quit her job and became my business manager. And that lasted a year. <laughs> because then we were both up at one o'clock in the morning wondering how we were gonna make payroll the next Friday. And you know, so she went back to, and that's when she became a diabetes educator. So, um, the marketing hat has been the one that I've worn the most. Um, building a sales and marketing, marketing and sales team has been, I would say, the reason that we won that award was because that team has uh, really uh, been able to uh, function at a high level in, in a market that, um, that, that hype curve, I mean, we were sort of down on the low end of that hype curve for a long time where um, Unrealistic expectations, and the, the thing that, that um, uh, CEMS prepared me for was, I have an easy time saying these words, and a salesman has an impossible time saying those words, because he wants, or he or she wants, to look like they know what they're talking about, otherwise they figure they're not going to get the sale, and they're going to get out escorted to the door, and so that is something that... Um, I, over and over again, I, we've, I, I probably had 120 people in 30 years go through the doors of the business with the intent to sell solar. I have 10 people right now who actually could, and they've learned how to say that they don't know, and it makes a difference. So the principles that I built the business on were, um, okay, so that, uh, to, it, re, re, what I was trying to do was to um, atone for the sins of the 1980s where there was a lot of shoddy work done in the name of solar. So uh, we needed to use accepted construction standards and work up to those standards, nothing less. We also needed to just have a real high priority in leaving a trail of well-performing systems, well-engineered, and of course material science gave me all the background I needed to be able to talk with electrical engineers and just, you know, we'd get down in the weeds whenever we needed to. And cultivating good relationships with utilities. The solar industry has uh, kind of known for having sort of a uh, combative relationship with the utility because we've had to force the uh, utilities to um, you know, to create a little bit of market space for us. Um, I would say that right now we're, we're moving from being a real policy driven market where legislation has to occur in order to um, let's say request a, or require that a utility form a little incentive program and then our sales guys jump on that and sell it like crazy until it's gone and then we kind of languish until the next little legislative fix. We're moving into an era where we're working more and more with the utilities because we figured out how to bring the capital in 
and um, capital that, that understands that you don't need a, a three-year payback, that you can actually you know, um, do like the utilities have done always, which is um, more like the 40-year payback or the 20-year payback. But your, your capital <coughs> understands that um, we're in the electric utility, the electric power market, we're not in the uh, consumer goods market. So, um, and something that uh, Professor Keller said, hire somebody who's better at the task. So, um, just a little joyride through uh, 30 years of systems. Off-grid was what we started with in the 1990s when um, solar was god-awful expensive. This is like the best piece of work I ever did, which is a battery box under the cabin um, so that the porcupines wouldn't um, eat their way in and chew the wires. <laughs> they also lived under the cabin. Um, and th this is a, uh, a few years later, this is a farmer down in, uh, uh, okay, so our market was uh, early adopters for a long time. People who had money and inclination to spend it this way. This guy um, was a, uh, actually, you wouldn't guess it, but he was a jumbo jet pilot who flew um, back and forth to Europe. Um, so three days out and back, and then three days cultivating the corn and the beans and, and then on to his next flight. And so he had, he grew all the food. We were there for a week doing the installation. He grew all the food that we ate there in between jumbo jet flights. Um, this was something that I thought was material science to a T. And it was made by an outfit in Michigan, photovoltaic shingles. Um, and we did uh, half a dozen, um, well, no, more like two dozen systems. And we were really promoting um, the photovoltaic shingles because it's true for, right? It, it serves as a shingle. It's a 40-year life and it generates electricity. What I didn't know was that they were, they were totally material science driven company um, and they didn't want to do any marketing. So I got two years into this and then they sold all their production for the next two years to a German company um, and I couldn't get them unless I bought a whole container load and brought them back. So um, I learned about that you want to work with companies that have some market savvy and the tech savvy. And the Green Institute was really the first commercial industrial system that we did um, and around 2004. And it was the largest system in Minnesota at the time. Um, it was a battery type system uh, because uh, at that time the, the inverter that we were able to use um, really qu required batteries. And so we were, we were doing batteries. I'm just uh, going to say that now we do, ba you know, this energy storage is a big deal now. And so we've come full circle, and I'm really uh, overjoyed to see more market opportunities for batteries. Um, this is a steel fabrication plant up in uh, Painesville, and this was a, it's a 500 kilowatt system, so we've kind of gotten really into the commercial industrial systems now, and, and we're selling this based on uh, an accommodation that the utility gives us for demand reduction. Um, and then... We've, uh, the, our surfboard was really pointed in the right direction, my sales and marketing team, when the community solar garden law was enacted in um, 2013. And so we've really ridden that one, and that was why we won the award. And the two guys on, um, the, on the left and the right have my sales and marketing guy and our COO, who are my exit strategy. <laughs> so with that, I think I'm...